Well, it's my great pleasure to be able to interview uh, Jack, Dr. Chiquita brooks Lashore, who's the head of CMS. Uh, you've now been in that role for a few months. Uh, not totally unfamiliar to you, having worked at uh, CMS before. Um, so I wanted to begin by talking about uh, your strategic vision for where CMS uh, should go over the next few years. Thanks, Zeke, for the, uh, the question. And you gave me a promotion. I'm not a doctor, but I am the head of, <laughs> I am the CMS administrator. And I'm so privileged and humbled to be in this position. It's such an incredible moment, I think, in our nation's history, in terms of our um, place in the healthcare system. I like to say that we're in charge of um, the three Ms, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and CHIP, and marketplace coverage, and just really thrilled to be in this role. As part of this, um, we, the senior, the senior leadership team, um, and I have put out a CMS vision. And at the start of it is really focusing on health equity. And the way that we are incorporating this in our decision making is by making how are we advancing health equity as our first question. And it really changes, I think, how we think about our policies and operations by putting that question um, first and foremost. Our second vision is about expanding coverage and care. And so part of that is enrolling people in all of the programs for which we oversee um, when they're eligible. And it's also focusing on that care piece, making sure that they actually have access to providers and uh, the drugs and all of the health care that they need. Third um, and fourth are really around making sure that we are engaging with stakeholders. So something that is incredibly important to us is really hearing from all of the individuals, the stakeholders of our healthcare system, especially those who actually our, get coverage through our programs and really make sure that their experience, their lived experience is a part of our decision making and that we are not just providing um, oversight, but that we are really leading in innovation, which of course is a, a big focus of, um, of, your, of the conference here today of making sure that we uh, are best in class in terms of the way that we're operating the programs and helping to drive the health um, system forward. And then finally would say that focused on also making sure that CMS is an inclusive workplace. Um, and because I think not only is that the right way to operate, but that's how we'll get the best um, out of our programs and the best uh, policy and operational decision making. At CMS. So one of those is increasing the number of people covered and you do have, mm -hmm. as you noted, responsibility for Medicare and the exchanges. And um, last I looked, we have 29 million people in America who don't have coverage, but 17 million of them are either eligible for Medicaid or eligible for the marketplaces, but aren't enrolled. Mm -hmm. How are we going to solve that problem? And that's the majority of uninsured in this country. If we just solve that little problem, we would get to over 96 percent coverage. It's such an important question that you raised. People who are eligible but don't um, enroll for a number of reasons. And I think that we have seen during this year, uh, we've had a few lessons learned. So for example, at the start of the administration, uh, the president opened up a special enrollment period and really increased the education and outreach efforts. Uh, and what we saw was a bump in enrollment. And, you know, we take it for granted that people know that there is coverage available to them, but we did see uh, hard to reach uh, communities really hearing and enrolling um, for the first time. And so in the coming open enrollment period, both the Medicare open enrollment period and marketplace, we are very focused on expanding our outreach and education efforts. So more money in navigators and assisters and certainly want all of the stakeholder community health plans to really continue to um, educate consumers about these options. And in same in the Medicaid program, um, continued 
continued outreach efforts. And I think um, there's so much pen and up demand. I had the privilege of being in Oklahoma um, on the dawn of their uh, new expansion, talked to Missouri um, uh, 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 earlier this week. There is so much interest in, um, in, in getting coverage. And when you actually educate people about what is newly available, you learn and you get people who are currently eligible for these programs but, uh, as well. Can I push back a little bit? I mean, these 17 sure. million has been, it's, it's a high number and it's separate from the expansion states where, you know, a number of people, 2 million people will get coverage. Um, mm -hmm. Are you thinking of doing anything like uh, more harmonization between the eligibility criteria of Medicaid and the marketplaces or auto enrollment, something that would sort of take away or reduce the amount of initiative someone would have to take and maybe just make it much more automatic for them, which we know would probably increase enrollment a lot more than education efforts, which are hard. I think all of those all of those strategies need to be on the table. So part of this is our partnership with the states and we are having this conversation as we, particularly as we think about the unwinding of the public health emergency, we've had a number of people enrolled in the Medicaid program because of not doing um, as many of the eligibility redeterminations. And, and we really wanna hold on and to your point, increase coverage of people who are not enrolled. And so some of that is, is really working with the states to try to make sure that we are continuing to uh, make sure we reach those populations. So whether it's people, a lot of the churn comes from people who are Medicaid eligible and then um, we don't get enrolled in marketplace coverage, the reverse, and also again, um, uh, whether the the processes are burdensome, and on the uh, the issue of auto enrollment, very much looking at what our um, authorities are. I think we also have a tremendous opportunity, as you probably know, in our rulemaking in the marketplace. We have allowed. Um, people to enroll at the lower income levels throughout the year next year and have that special enrollment period. And I think part, part of our thinking is, as the American Rescue Plan has made coverage more affordable, we have seen quite a significant increase in, um, in coverage and uh, in, the, in enrollment in the marketplace and, what, and really wanting to hold on onto that and making sure for these populations that often change incomes pretty, um, pretty often during the course of the year, really making it easier. So I wanted to, you mentioned affordability. I wanted mm -hmm. to focus on affordability because sometimes it feels like it's not at the top of mind of CMS. In your health affairs blog post, where you laid out a lot of details, one of the details you noted is that six of the uh, demonstration projects in uh, the innovation center actually showed savings for the government and could be generalized. And at least two of them are, you might say, big platform changes, AC, Pioneer ACOs and the Maryland all-payer model. Um, do you think you're going to expand those and, and increase uh, the number of states maybe that are doing Maryland or expand ACOs in a way that, that will actually cover more of the country? I would say in the larger, your larger question about our focus on accountable care organizations, I mean, we are certainly seeing and want to encourage uh, different models that really are integrating care better that, as, as you say, Zeke, is, is, is really um, saving money for the federal government and certainly for, um, for people, for the people covered by the programs. I can't speak to whether we'll, you know, what our, our future will be other than to say we are very focused on outlining our strategy, which, you know, we started to with the blog in which we will continue to do and um, upcoming um, information that we'll be releasing. And our focus is really on making sure that our models are really driving health equity and driving value um, in a way that that makes sense for for the people that are served, as well as making sure that we are appealing to a broader um, 
group of providers. And we can talk more about that, but that's a real focus of um, the Innovation Center and our work at CMS more broadly to make sure that we are um, including more of the provider community in our value-based care and our accountable care, uh, accountable care models. So one of the things I think um, a lot of people are uh, hopeful for is a bit more integration between Medicare, Medicaid, and the exchange plans with the innovation, dem uh, the innovation centers demonstration projects to put mm -hmm. more revenue, uh, you might say, pushing in the same direction for mm -hmm. health systems and physicians and other providers. Uh, is that, do you think, going to be a theme of uh, uh, going forward? Yes, I, we are very focused on integration. Again, I say it, integration across the three M's, all of our programs, and also um, certainly want the private sector uh, to see what the, the work that, um, that CMS is doing to be uh, uh, integrated with the ideas of the private sector as well. And so I would say in terms of the innovation authority, it's around the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And we are very focused on figuring out how to get states um, how to work better with states. And there are other ways, right? So again, thinking about the safety net providers, do we, are we able to achieve some of our, um, our priorities focusing on the providers that serve um, in multiple programs, the health plans, certainly what an incredible opportunity as we see more plans participating in all three programs um, and their ability to drive integration, particularly for those places of intersection like um, uh, dual eligibles who are eligible for both Medicaid and, and, um, and Medicare, who, as we all know, are some of our um, seniors with or people with disabilities with some of the highest health needs. And in some respects, the most natural place where integrated care is going to be beneficial, both for the person and certainly um, to uh, the federal government and states in terms of cost. So a lot of the attendees uh, at uh, Health uh, are entrepreneurs, uh, either in the payer space or in uh, pro provider space. Um, what would your message be to them about intersecting with CMS and how the strategy is likely to affect new startups and new ways of trying to approach care, uh, whether they're telemedicine or new delivery models or new payment models? I would say that we at CMS are really focused on making sure that uh, the private sector is very engaged in what we are doing, i.e. you are um, giving us input early to our policymaking and operations. So we really want to hear the ideas of the private sector, really want to understand how the decisions CMS is making, how they, I like to say, land on the ground, how they, um, what it feels like is you know, from my prior time, I know that sometimes what CMS is saying is not exactly how things are operating on the ground. We don't know everything. And so we really do want to hear how um, those um, communities and, and providers and health plans, uh, their perspectives. And I would say we have a strong desire to continue to move in an innovative way for all of the programs to embrace innovation and really be the drivers of, of um, innovative ideas and, and not just reactors. Um, there's been some ambiguity uh, in the community around uh, direct contracting um, and I think just unclarity. Um, can you add some clarity? Are we going to have more direct contracting? Is that a direction we should go? Do you think it's going to help with the question of equity, quality and cost? How are you thinking about it? I think that it's so critical. And um, my colleague, Liz Fowler, has really been so thoughtful in leading this work in the Innovation Center of really examining what have we learned over the last 10 years? What have the models told us? And we've you know, started to outline some of the things that we see, which is there is a lot of good in what we have learned, but some real weaknesses in terms of of not being able to answer the question of whether these models drive equity. And so 
what we are going to be doing as we move forward is really making sure we can answer those questions um, and making tweaks to make sure that uh, that these types of programs really have the person at the center. And again, like the innovation center is you know, its authority is really to test models, to really determine where we can get um, value from a um, from a federal government perspective, really wanting to make sure that we are emphasizing better care for people um, as part of that. And, and I hope that that is, is coming through in terms of the direction we're headed. So can I ask you uh, <laughs> one thing that's gotten a lot of people's attention is, uh, I think the emphasis on uh, more mandatory programs, fewer voluntary programs, it certainly you know, warms my heart uh, since I've been pounding away at it for about five or six years now. Um, do you think the more, more mandatory programs would obviously make it a, little, a lot easier for uh, CMS to evaluate uh, these changes? Do you think it'll have a big impact on equity and help uh, providers be uh, ensure that all populations in the country are getting high quality care? I would say that not necessarily. And that's, I think, the most, that's a really important point. Your question about would it, would a mandatory model equal improving health equity? And that's why I would say we will evaluate very carefully where we need to go. And the reason why I say that is because requiring health equity to me, just in terms of defining it, is partially about underserved populations. It's also about the providers that serve underserved populations. And so, you know, what we have in some instances and in some parts of these various programs is cherry picking and things along those lines. And what we want to make sure is that um, in our mandatory models, if we go in that direction, that providers who are, may not have the capital to participate or um, are in a position to take on the level of risk are really not left out of, um, of these types of programs, especially if they're going to be mandatory. So as you probably can see from um, <laughs> my answers, I'm really focused on making sure that we don't move in a in a what is overall a positive direction, but then leave behind the people who are most in need of us to move in a new direction. So can I just ask you a follow up there? <laughs> um, sure. Which uh, um, one of the things some places, some countries do is in their risk adjustment model actually include socioeconomic factors or other factors that are shown to lead to uh, disparate and worse health outcomes to try to improve or mm -hmm. bonus for caring uh, for patients who are underserved and have been uh, uh, in uh, deprived areas. And, you know, our whole system where we try to identify underserved populations or underserved communities, whether it's rural or uh, uh, urban, um, do you think that's an area that CMS might do more in, modify the risk adjustment or give bonuses or other incentives? I certainly think that that thinking about these issues is critical and something CMS is doing. We are certainly focused on what, it, what are the right data that we're collecting. Again, not just in the Innovation Center, but across the programs. And we know the answer is we are not collecting enough data, not a, collecting enough demographic data. And so that's I would say a starting threshold, but we need to um, move much more in a direction of of, of really paying um, paying for for addressing these um, the these other factors. Again, though, we have to balance it with not it not leading to cherry picking or um, leaving some communities behind. And so that's the balance of getting the data, making sure it's consistent, it's usable, uh, and also making sure that we're not um, creative, creating the wrong incentives. I'm hearing that we might have a new dashboard on disparities, which a lot <laughs> of us really love to have. Is that uh, a direction we might be going? 
I think that um, there there certainly could be, um, and I am very interested in looking at ways that we can make more transparent how different types of um, providers, plans, what all it, that it is are are really addressing health equity. And I'm sure that you have plenty of ideas for me about how we can do that. And I welcome you to send them on. <laughs> Let me ask you a personal question. What yes. in your first few months is the most surprising thing about the job uh, that you've taken over uh, that you might not have expected before, even though you probably, of all administrators, had a lot more experience coming into this job and certainly coming into the agency than, uh, say, the previous few administrators? I think personally what has been the most surprising about having this role is how meaningful it is to other people that I am in this seat how much people care when I show up how um, how meaningful it is that a CMS administrator cares to visit a tribe cares to listen to a group of advocates cares to go to an FQHC when I go places it's meaningful. And that has been very um, unexpected and has made me appreciate uh, the role of the CMS administrator and my responsibility to shed a light on um, places that don't often get the attention that they deserve. Well, I can certainly speak for many of the people participating in health this year that you're showing up being willing to answer questions and being forthright about your answers is truly meaningful. And we greatly appreciate uh, your coming uh, and uh, look forward to collaborating with you over the next few years uh, at the helm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.